some of you already know, um, my wife uh, contracted the virus. Um, so please pray for her. It's been quite a week for us. Um, although uh, Andre and I, we've been exposed, you know, Andre got tested at least two times. Uh, two times, uh, twice it was a PCR and once it was a rapid test. And every time he came out negative, I got tested once and it was negative. So, but still, for my, my wife tested positive, had all the symptoms. Uh, we are trying to be cautious. That's why I'm doing this for all uh, this morning. You know, but, you know, I'm okay. I only have a little actually spoke. Um, so, I'm going to quarantine for the next few days, you know, back to school. So, for 10 days, and then get tested again. If it's negative, or then maybe. Just maybe I'll be able to be there uh, next Sunday. You know, but that's what we have today. I'm so grateful uh, that the elders make uh, for us to have this time together. Thank you, Jim, for uh, setting this up. And also, uh, the I, I recorded it yesterday, and they will play it today. Um, so I wish I had done it twice, you know, um, but it's all good, you know, God is good. Find ways to worship. If you guys don't mind, I am going to be a prayer. Um, and go ahead and start it uh, on YouTube. Feel free to drop a line in the chat. You know, you can ask a question. This is a Bible class. Those of you are in the auditorium, and uh, speak up when you have a question. You know, we're gonna try to keep as interactive as possible. All right. So again, for some prayers, and I love you guys, and we're going to enjoy this class as much as we can. Uh, would you guys mind and pray with me? Father <clears throat> God, I am so glad. I am so thankful for this opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Father, for everything you're doing in our lives. You are awesome. You are the Alpha. You are the Omega. And I know, Father, with this pandemic and so many other things going on, it can be so hard uh, for us to actually practice our faith. But, Father, we cannot give up. We will never give up. We will keep on going because we are called to do this. Thank you, Jesus, for this platform. Thank you, Jesus, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. But I'm so grateful for the healing you are bringing in our house. So grateful for the healing you are bringing in our wife. Father, I'm also praying comfort for all those who are suffering. Past week, I've heard some very tough news that some of our family, Father, and I pray you can be with them, you can shelter them, you can comfort them, and if there's any possible, and do help us to do that. We love you, Lord, and we pray. In your son Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, hopefully you guys can still hear me. I'm sorry. Um, I have decided that for the next few weeks, you know, we're near, uh, we'll be taking a break, the adult class, and I don't know if uh, I don't know if we need. I'm sorry. Okay, I thought I thought someone. Um, I don't know if you're here if I'm right now listening. Well, brother, I want you to fly. We you and your family. Uh, we love you. Uh, thank you for the last last the last two weeks, and uh, and I'm looking forward to. So Jeff, you have a page. I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay, can everybody still hear me? All right, so. Uh, as I mentioned, I will be taking a 
to class for the next uh, few weeks. And uh, we are going to be talking about the book of First Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians. Uh, so I hope you guys can hear me. If you guys can hear me that well, you know, that's why we put the slides together. I can actually see what uh, I will be talking about. Um, so before we get started with the content of the book of First Corinthians, uh, I'd like to provide a little background of the book, especially the church in Corinth. You know, Paul was writing to a specific audience when he wrote First Corinthians. You know, that's one of those things that uh, I always like to emphasize on whenever we are reading a specific book in the Bible, especially an epistle, you know, a letter. All the power and epistles in the New Testament, they were written to specific audiences, you know, and First Corinthians uh, was one of them. So before we get started with the letter itself, I'd like to take the time to talk about the church in Corinth, the genesis of the church in Corinth. You know, I hope you guys can still hear me. So uh, the church in Corinth, it was established by Paul. And if you were to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 10 and 11, you will be able to see that Paul talks about how he helped lay the foundation for the church. You know, that's very important to understand because throughout the letter of 1 Corinthians, you can see Paul's rhetoric, his tone uh, in the letter. It clearly shows that Paul had and still has a relationship with those people. For example, if you were to read the letter that he wrote to the church in Rome, you can see that Paul did quite really have a close relationship with them. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul named a lot of people by name. In Romans, not so much. You know, so 1 Corinthians was a little more personal for Paul because he was invested uh, in that church. You know, he knew some of the uh, brothers and sisters in that church personally. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse number, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 3, verse number 10 and 11, uh, I, I apologize. This should say 1 Corinthians chapter 3, not chapter 1. Uh, because of God's grace to me, Paul said, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. And Paul says, others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be careful for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. Paul saying the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ himself. You know, and that's the beauty of our congregation. You know, the Lord's church must be built on the teachings of Jesus Christ, on the fact that Jesus Christ is the rock that the church is built upon. When the church is built on any other things other than Jesus Christ, you know, um, well, let's just say it's not good. You know, it's a faulty foundation. You know, so Paul is saying, I was involved in the establishment of the church. This is very important to understand. As I mentioned, when you look at the rhetoric, throughout the letter, you know, and how personal Paul was, you will understand why Paul's tone was either so loving, so harsh, so personal, because Paul was invested, you know, with that, in that church. So uh, I want you guys to keep that in mind. You know, um, Paul helped establish that church on his second missionary journey. You know, generally speaking, um, uh, theologians, Bible scholars will say Paul had three missionary journeys. You know, I believe he had more than three, but generally speaking, he had three. It wasn't the second one. Those of you who are part of my Wednesday evening Bible class, we are studying the book of Acts. I'm going to take the time to promote that class. Currently, we are looking at Acts chapter 17 and 18, you know, when Paul was in Athens and how he took the time to actually evangelize certain philosophers, you know, the Epicureans and Stoicism, 
you know, this kind of people. And Paul was talking to them about this statue that he saw, and there was an inscription at the bottom of it that says, to an unknown God. And, you know, if you're part of my class, you understand some of the things we've been talking about. You know, last Wednesday night, we talked about how to engage a non-believer, you know, which is what Paul was doing. You know, so I want you guys to join us on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. as we um, study, as we make our way through uh, the book of Acts. You know, but it was in Acts chapter 18, after Paul left Athens, he went to Corinth. You can read Acts 18, verse number 1 and 2. And in Corinth, he met Aquila and Priscilla. And he probably met these people because, first of all, they were of the same strain. Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. That, that was his job. That's what he did for a living when the church wasn't supporting him financially. Because Paul wasn't like me as a preacher of a local church. Paul was more like uh, uh, an evangelist you know, who went around from town to town, city to city. To, uh, to preach the word. And a lot of times, churches uh, financially supported him. You know, in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul talk about that. Paul talk about how other churches supported his work uh, in Corinth because Paul stayed in Corinth for at least uh, two years or so, you know, to start the church. And he was taking money from other churches to start the work in Corinth because as the church in Corinth was being established, they didn't have the financial structure uh, uh, already to support their local preacher, who was Paul, for at least two years. You know, Paul made mention of that in 2 Corinthians. You know, but Aquila and Priscilla, they were very much involved in the establishment of the church in Corinth. And later, we're going to see Apollos and, of course, Paul's original companions, such as uh, Timothy and Silas, were part of it. Uh, let's look at Acts 18, you know, uh, that's the book of Acts chronicles the work of the apostles and the establishment of the church. You know, Acts, really, the title of the book of Acts should be Acts of the Apostles, especially Peter and Paul. The first half of the book of Acts, from like chapter 1 all the way through chapter, I would say, 11 or 12, it's about Peter. And from chapter 12 to the last chapter, which is 28, I believe, it's about Paul. You know, but mainly there are other uh, disciples and apostles mentioned in there as well. You know, so Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 18, listen to what the Bible says. Then Paul left Athens. He was in Athens evangelizing in Acts 17 when he made that famous sermon on Mars Hill. And Paul went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila. Now, at that time, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they were in Rome, and the emperor Claudius, I'm sorry, Caesar Claudius had expelled all Jews out of Rome. And so Aquila and Priscilla left Rome and went back to Corinth. You know, eventually those Jews were going to go back to Rome, and that was going to create certain problems at the church in Rome, because there were churches of Christ in Rome that were mainly comprised of Gentiles. When the Jews went back to Rome, it was going to create some friction. And that's one of the reasons why Paul wrote Romans. You know, and if you're familiar with the history behind it, understanding they were expelled and went back and they created some problems, you know, so Paul wrote Romans to encourage Jews and Gentiles to get along. You know, so anyway, not just for the book of Romans. Maybe we teach Romans after we've done with 1 Corinthians. You know, so Paul lived in Corinth and he became friends with Aquila and Priscilla because they were tent makers. So they probably worked together and they evangelized together and they were very much involved in the establishment of the church in Corinth. So, so as I mentioned earlier, Paul spent on two years. If you keep reading in Acts 18, the Bible says it was one year and a half. There were, and God told Paul, I want you to stay there. I want you not to be shy and to preach the word out loud. And God said, I'm going to protect you. And after two years, after the establishment of the church, some people started to revolt against Paul. 
and they were starting to attack Paul. And they even brought Paul in front of the full council and, you know, and Paul evoked his Roman citizenship, you know, and, you know, they let him go eventually because they wouldn't have nothing on him. You know, so I just want to provide a little bit of background for you guys to understand how invested Paul was in the success, in the establishment and the success of the church in Corinth. Now, it's also important for us to understand, like, the socioeconomic background of the city of Corinth, because the church in Corinth resembled the demographics of the city. I am a firm believer that the church located uh, in whatever city, if we do the job that we are supposed to be doing, we should resemble the demographics of the city. Like, for example, Corinth, because of its location, they had ports. It was a commerce city, so it was very wealthy. And as you read the letters, First and Second Corinthians, which, by the way, Paul wrote at least four letters to the church in Corinth. We only have two, but he wrote at least four. And later in the study, I'm going to show you the other letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that we don't have. You know, we just never uncover those letters. I do believe that maybe God only wants us to have first and second Corinthians. I don't know. But he were at least four. Maybe there were more. You know, so if you read first and second Corinthians, you will see that there were wealthy people in the church. There were poor people in the church. There were middle class people in the church. You know, and that created a problem. It created a problem. And we're going to read later when they were eating together because it was their customs for, for all church folks to get together and eat. Kind of like we do on the fellowship Sunday, right? But the way they did it, it's like the wealthy people came and they would bring that food, eat all the food, and, you know, they didn't leave any for all the rest of the people. But we'll get there. That's around like chapter 11 or 12, you know, we'll, we'll get there. But I, I want you to understand there were wealthy people and poor people in the city of Corinth, and they were the same kind of structure as well, economically speaking, in the church as well, because the church resembled the demographics of the city. That's very important. You know, there were mispopulation in Corinth. There were Greeks, Romans, Jews, and many others. And they all also, if you look at the demographics of the church in Corinth, there were a mixed group of people. And kind of like our church here in Waterbury, there are people from the islands like me. There are, uh, you know, um, all sort of different people from ethnicity to uh, the economic differences. You know, so um, by keeping that in mind, we will understand some of the problems we were dealing with, which is why I chose to entitle this series of lessons how to solve conflicts in the church. How to solve conflicts in the church. Because the church in Corinth had to deal with a lot of different problems, with a lot of different conflicts. <laughs> Except us, Waterbury, we've never had to deal with any sort of problems. We are perfect church, right? So there's ever been any conflicts. I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, so it's important for us to know that because as a church, we're going to have some conflicts. And I think First Corinthians can help us deal with some of these issues. Um, also, in the city of Corinth, the city of Corinth was known for its immorality and, um, and, and, and like such as the temple of Aphrodite. There were temple prostitutes. You know, the city of Corinth was known for these things. Unfortunately, some of those immoral practices found their way into the church. And Paul had to deal with that. You guys remember the famous passage in chapter 5 where Paul was exhorting this brother who slept with his father's wife. And Paul spent chapter 6, I believe, chapter 7, talked about sexual immorality and marriages because some of the immoral practices that were going on in, uh, uh, in the city found their way in the church. You know why? Because church folk are sinners, you know, and a lot of those new converts uh, who came into the church, they were still 
some of them probably were still engaged in uh, in their old way of life. You know, and Paul's going to talk about that. Paul's going to exhort many of them. And again, he's strong whenever he talks about some of those things with the church sound a little bit harsh, you know, and, and, and I keep saying that because I want you to understand why Paul felt like he could talk the way he did uh, with the folks in Corinth because he had a personal relationship with them. He was invested in that church, okay? I hope you guys are still with me. This information are very important before we can delve into the text itself. You know, the city was known for its diversity, you know, from socially speaking, economically speaking, politically speaking, ethically, you know, uh, uh, ethnicity, and all of that. And the same way the city of Corinth was diverse, the church in Corinth was a diverse church as well. There were many converts from Judaism. There were Judaizers, you know, but uh, uh, if you read Acts 18, the Bible says how the church got started. Paul was going from synagogue to synagogue on Saturdays because they were still worshiping on Saturdays, uh, still obeying Sabbath laws. And Paul, where Paul was going to synagogues to teach them, to, uh, to tell them about Jesus. And some folks in the synagogues wouldn't have it. You know, they're like, we're still Jews and obeying the old law. We still want to, to get circumcised. And Paul told them in Acts 17, Paul said, it is important for me to go to you first. You know why? Because if you read what Jesus' command was to his apostles in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus said, I want you to stay in Jerusalem and you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses where? In Judea, Samaria, and the rest, the rest of the world. The Jews have dibs on the gospel. Okay, it started with them first. So Paul went to them first. And then when they rejected it, Paul said, now I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Because Paul's main mission was to be a preacher to the Gentiles. So since they weren't listening in the synagogue, well, some of them, some did believe and got baptized. And Paul started to preach to the Gentiles, such as, uh, the household of Crispus and, and all these other people, you know, uh, that Paul, who got converted and became part of the church, you know. And now the problem is when you take Jews who are living according to the old law for a very long time and pagans and Gentiles who are living in the world for a very long time, although they be Christians, they still have their old ways. And some of those things found their ways into the church, such as I believe in chapter 14, 15, Paul had to deal with eating food sacrificed to idols because some of those Gentiles, they used to do that. And now as Christians in the church, they were still doing it. And some of the Jews who never done that, they were trying to force some of their views on them. They saying, hey, you can't do this. And Paul had to intervene to talk about eating food sacrificed to idols. Because the Gentiles Christians were saying, listen, I have the right to do anything. I can eat food sacrifice to idol. Why don't you, why do you, Christian Jews, have an issue with that? You know, and the Christian Jews were saying, no, you can't. So Paul had to intervene. You know, all these things are important because when you read the letter, if you know the background where those Christians came from with their own views, their own religious background. You can understand why there were so many issues in the church. And I think it's important to understand because today in the church, any church, even the one Bear Church of Christ is not exempt. Our own personal life experience, our own upbringing, our own political views, our own everything can influence how we understand scripture sometimes, how we live together. And sometimes those things can create conflicts. Sometimes those things can create schism, fractions, frictions, whatever you want to call it. And I believe the book of First Corinthians can help shed some light on those issues, how to deal with these things, because it's very important for the church to stand together. Now, the very first problem 
that Paul dealt with in the book of First Corinthians, it was the problem of disunity. Problem of disunity. Um, if you've been to the Watermere Church of Christ, you know, the last few years, you know that's a very important topic to me. Because I believe for the church as we know it to progress, for the church as we know it, for us as a church body, to actually do the Lord's work, we have to be united. We have to be united. Because if we're not, there's a lot of things we cannot do. So the, the first thing Paul was dealing with, the first issue was the issue of disunity in the church. And beloved, we as a congregation, we're not immune to that. Okay, so let's get into this. I don't know how much longer I have uh, hopefully, let's see how far we can get. From the very opening of the letter, you know, Paul's, Paul's letters, like you can see Paul's rhetoric in all the epistles that he wrote. Paul always follows specific format. There's the greeting section of the letter. You know, that's where he says, I, the apostle Paul, one servant of Jesus Christ, you know, and he identified the audience as far as who he's writing to, to the church of God in Corinth. That's what Paul called the church in Corinth, the church of God in Corinth, okay? I'm not saying it's not the church of Christ, but I'm just saying these are the words Paul used to describe the Lord's church in Corinth. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be his holy people, listen to the word which Paul was very intentional as he opened the letter. Paul says, together, with all those who, I'm sorry, with all those everywhere, from the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord, and ours. Paul says, we are called to be one people together. From the get-go, you can see that Paul uh, 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 is identifying the very first problem that he wanted to deal with, which was uh, disunity, the lack of harmony in the church. Something that I believe to be very important. I'm sorry. So, obviously, as I said, Paul was concerned with the lack of unity in the church. Now, here's how Paul started to deal with it. And Paul jumped right into it. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another. Wait a minute. Is that possible. We're going to talk about that, but I want you to put that in your mind. Is it possible for all of us at the Water Bear Church of Christ to agree with one another on everything? I can see our faces, but I can tell some of you might be smiling right about now. All right. In what you say, and there are, and let there be no divisions among you. Paul says there shouldn't be any division among you because there was division in the church, Paul says, but that you be perfectly, perfectly united in mind and in thought. Is that possible? Is it possible with all the differences that exist between us in the church from our background, our upbringing, our own personal worldviews? our own perspective on things, our own interpretation of certain verses in the Bible. How can Paul expect the church to be perfectly united in mind and in thought? That sounds like a mighty tall order. I really want you guys, I really want those words to sink in, you know, because whenever you read it, you're like, uh, I'm not so sure, Brother Paul. You know, like maybe, maybe the church in court, but you haven't met the folks at the Waterbury Church of Christ. I love y'all saints. You know, I'm just saying, let's be real this morning. We got to be real. I've been cooked up in my house, so I'm just excited, you know, to get all of this out. I have a lot to say. So anyway, um, Paul says, be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Love it. Every church, even the Waterbury Church of Christ, has to deal with some form of conflict or disagreement. Let's be honest, we've had different disagreements in our congregation. We've managed to deal with some of them as best as we can. You know, 
for the next few weeks as we look at the church in Corinth, I hope we can learn a few things so that we can make our way uh, throughout this new year as a church that is growing closer together and a church that is growing closer to Christ. And I believe if our goal is to grow closer to Christ, we must grow closer together. We cannot fully grow closer to Christ if we are not growing closer together as a church. That's very important. You know, so how can we solve conflict and disagreement in the church? Paul said, number one, be in agreement with one another. I, I, I don't know if I can... If, if I can hear you guys, if you guys say anything, do you guys think it's possible to be in agreement with one another? Because there are two things that Paul pointed out in 1 Corinthians, the things we teach and the things we practice in the church. We need to be in agreement regarding these things. Listen, I really don't think Paul was saying we need to agree on everything on everything such as mundane things, you know, because that's just impossible. You know, I don't know who all are in the audience or who are watching online right now. We are going to have our own personal perspective on certain things. And for the most part, it's okay. We have to understand that. It's okay to have brothers and sisters in Christ that have, who have different perspectives on life, on politics, on movies and, and sports and things. So we're not always going to agree on all of that, on food choices, you know, uh, 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 on culture, uh, uh, on all these different things. But when it comes to the church, it's important for us to agree on doctrines and the things we practice. Even then, even there, you may find there are some differences in our own personal views. I was just talking to my father earlier, who'd been a preacher of the gospel in the Lord's church way longer than I've been alive. And there are some, boy, I'm telling you, that and I, we get into it. You know, there are certain things in scripture we, we have differences on, you know? And I think it was Jim Chris once who mentioned there are certain things in the Bible, they are bullseye issues. You know, and I'm going to show that to you as well for, uh, throughout the letter in Corinth. Because there are certain things in the church, it, there are matters of preferences, not really doctrines. And sometimes we can take something, we can take something that is a matter of personal preference, and we want to bind it on people as a doctrine when it's not. If you go to other churches of Christ, you may see that there are certain things they do differently than us. Like, I will never forget when I got to Waterbury for the first time, man, like 14 years ago, 14 years ago. I've been in the church for 14 years. If I'm counting the, the few months I did as an intern, I was, I was mad young, y'all. You know, but anyway, you know, uh, 14 years ago, first time I worshiped with the Waterbury Church, and I remember when I saw people bringing cards up front to Jim Chris, writing, I'm like, what in the world is going on? That was weird to me. I've never seen that before, you know? And that's just what we do. Is it wrong? No. Uh, can I go to another church and say, you guys need to write your prayers on the card and hand them to the preacher? No, I can do that. That's just a matter of personal preferences. That's just what their church does. And this does not mean every church. You guys understand what I'm saying? There are certain things some churches do. It's not a matter of doctrine. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind because the word of God must guide our teachings and practices in the church. The word of God. If we leave it up to every single one of us to determine what we should teach, how we should worship, how we should evangelize, how we should live our lives, every single one of us would have a different perspective on things. In the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me, let, me, let me make sure I remember this co correctly. 
In the book of Deuteronomy, um, let's see here. Deuteronomy, uh, yes, I think it's not chapter eight. Yeah, chapter six. In chapter six, if you read verse number 18, that's after the people of, uh, of God got out of Egypt. And God was trying to provide them with some structure, new structure as to how to live. That's why God provided uh, the Pentateuch to the nation of Israel. They were a new nation. They needed structure. They needed laws. They needed organization. They needed leadership with Moses and Joshua. And God provided the, 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 the priest, you know, to sort of guide them spiritually. You know, and God provided laws. Some of those laws were secular. Some of those laws were religious, okay? And a part of those religious laws in Deuteronomy 6, 18, God said, you shall not do what is right and good. I'm sorry. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Um, there was another verse here that I was looking where God told him, it, it's, I'm not going to have time to read the whole chapter, where God told him, you shall not do whatever is right in your own eye. Yeah, oh, I found it, I found it. Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 18, in regard to worship, God was prescribing them a place for worship. And listen to what God says in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 12, if you're taking notes, that's Deuteronomy 12, verse number 8. Deuteronomy 12, verse number 8. God said, you shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. God said, every single one of you in regard to worship, you have an idea what you should do. God said, uh-uh, don't do that. Not every man shouldn't be coming in here doing what they think should be done in regard to worship. God said, I am going to tell you what to do. You may not always like it. You may not always agree with it. I'm going to tell you. So that's why it's important for us to allow the word of God to guide our teachings and practices in the church. And let's be honest, even then, a lot of times people disagree on the meaning and the interpretation of the word of God. A lot of times people disagree with that. What happens, what do you guys think happen when the problem does not have a clear biblical answer? Because the first thing we need to do is, okay, what does the word of God have to say about it? Not what, the, what do the elders have to say? What are other churches doing? What does the pastor have to say? What, uh, what, what's the best thing to do? No. The first thing is, what does the word of God have to say about it? Now, we, we will come, we, we will find ourselves, and we've been there at the Word of the Church of Christ, where we're like, okay, the Bible is not really clear on this issue. You know why? Because it's a matter of preferences. It's a matter of personal opinion. There are certain things, it's not really a biblical thing. It's simply a matter of preferences. Now, what do we do? Decisions have to be made. How do we proceed? Do you guys remember when our church had the opportunity to purchase the land, I believe, on, the, on my left? I don't know if you guys remember. There was like those people on the left side of the building who were selling their property. They offered it to us. Uh, some, of, some people in the church wanted to purchase it. Some people did not. You know, the Bible doesn't have to say anything about that. How do we proceed? You know, this is what I'm saying. And after the leadership did the right thing, we sort of put it to a vote, you know, and lo and behold, if I'm correctly, I think it was God who made somebody purchase the property before we even made a move. You know, I'm like, there you go. You have your answer. You know, certain times church will find themselves dealing with things that could be a conflict, but they're not matters of doctrine. What do we do? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, listen to the problem that they were dealing with. The problem that actually created conflict in the church. Here it is. Some of you said, I am of Paul. Now, this version says, I follow. I think it's the wrong 
translation. I'm not saying, well, let me, let me, let me retract that. It is best to translate that I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. Cephas is Peter, by the way, or Jesus Christ. So the church found themselves fighting over key preachers in the church. Apollos, Paul, Peter, and Christ. It's like, why? Why, right? Well, beloved, if we are going to promote unity and harmony in the church, one of the first things we must do, we need to value others above ourselves. Value others above yourself. And always look out for the collective interests of the church. There are things that are not a matter of doctrine. There are things, it's a matter of personal preferences, it's a matter of personal opinion and things like that. Every single one of us, we need to have the desire to work what's best for the church, even if we don't get our way. Does that make sense? Personally, there have been certain decisions uh, the leadership had made uh, in the church where I disagree. But I, I told the others, listen, I'm going to fall back because if this is what's best for the church, it doesn't matter what I think, but it's what's best for the church. You know, we, every single one of us, we need to have the desire to be okay, to be not, not okay, to be more than happy if the decision is made and it's best for the church as a whole. And it's not you getting your way. You go to the others and say, no, this is how it needs to be done. This is what needs to happen. No, you don't have to get your way, especially if it's not a matter of doctrine. It's, is it what's best for the church? And are we looking out for the interests of others, or are we only looking out for our own interests, our own selfish perspective? You know, I know we're shifting tone here, but that's exactly some of the issues that were going on in the church in Corinth. Um, listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3 and 4. Do nothing. Paul was writing to the church, to a whole church in Philippi. Paul, church, do, Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests only, but each to the interests of others. Paul says, as a church, you should only be looking to get your way. Think of what's best for other people in the church. Think of what's best for the church as a whole. Here's another verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, 24. Now, some of the people in the church in Corinth, as I mentioned earlier, some of them were Gentiles. Some of them were Jews. They have different backgrounds. They came into the church with their own perspective. They came into the church with their own reality, with their own views, and they started fighting over things. Paul said, some of you are saying, I have the right to do anything. I have the right to eat and sacrifice to idols. Why do those Christian Jews have an issue with it? Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Just because us individually may have the right to do something. We need to ask ourselves, how does the collective body benefit from it? That's what Paul is saying here. Not individualism, but collectivism. The church is a community. We need to do things to make decisions that is best for everyone, not for one person or a few, but for everyone. Paul says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. I should, we should not seek their own good. People should not seek their own good, but the good of others, other people in the church. Does that make sense? So to deal with the problem of disunity, it's important for us to keep thinking what's best for the church as a whole. Not, not, not what's best for me. I, I, I want to go to the others and tell the others to do it how I like to. No, 
what's best for the first of all what does the bible say and second of all what's best for the church as a whole because if you're only thinking about yourself like them folks in the church in Corinth, it's going to create division it's going to make the, the elders job difficult which by the way the bible says don't give them grief let them lead with joy that's a biblical command y'all so we need to always ask ourselves what's best for us as a collective body you know not me personally especially when it's not a matter of doctrine look at where we are right now you know i'm at home and unfortunately because i've been exposed to covid i have to teach from here Frankly, I wish that wasn't the case. I don't like talking to a screen, y'all. You know, but that's what we have to do. You know, and and maybe we may have to do to make some changes again, you know, for our worship. As we move forward in 2022, we're going to deal with some other challenges. And I want us as a church to be mindful of the collective body. It's not, not, not well, the others need to do it this way. We need to do it that way. It's what's best for us. And sometimes, folks, we are not going to get our way. And if you are a mature saint, you need to be humble enough to say, well, I don't really like it this way. But this is what's best for the church. So I'm going to find a way to be okay with it. Does that make sense? Especially if it's not something doctrinal. We are going to do that if we are going to, we are going to have to do that, to develop that mentality uh, of putting others in the church first, if we are going to move forward. Jim, I see you coming ahead. Is it time for me to stop? Yeah. Just, just, you huh? Yeah, we're good. Time to end. Uh, do I have more time? Yeah, you're out of time. Okay. Well, um. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I'm sorry if uh, we didn't have much questions. I promise that Sunday we'll, we'll take questions. And I hope uh, you guys took everything that we talk about under consideration because I believe that the church in Corinth dealt with some issues. Uh, Paul had to intervene and teach them biblical and godly ways to deal with things. And we as a church body, we're going to have to do that. God bless you. Enjoy worship. I'm going to be on YouTube. I'll try to be on the chat and say a few things, you know, for those of you online, if you want to, uh, if you want to talk. And I, I do believe those of us watching at home, we can be interactive, okay? So let's enjoy worship. I love y'all. And Lord willing, I'll see you guys, who knows, next Sunday. Um, thank you guys so much for the time.